everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our event. I'd like to welcome those from Bellevue College and those who are outside of our campus. Thank you so much for coming to our webinar and supporting um, our API community with your attendance. So in celebration of API Heritage Month, we, put, we of Bellevue College put up a webinar to address the issues that are currently affecting the API community in Washington State and as a global issue. So working against hate and for solidarity is very vital in helping the people that we often ignore or put the relevance to. So we are trying to bring out these issues in hopes that we build a community based on understanding and support. To, well, first off for introductions, for those of you who are not from Bellevue College, I'm Sunny Lim. I am the Asian Pacific Islander Affinity Student Coordinator. I help organizations and students to um, bring out the issues and events that they feel that is needed in our community. I'm also part of APISA, which is the Asian Pacific Islander Student Association, which is a student-led organization to help promote and influence API leaders in the future. We have three wonderful panelists today to help us with these troubling issues. And I would like to first off introduce um, our host to Nguyen, if she would like to start off through us. Thank you, everybody. I'm Tu Nguyen, I'm the Executive Director at OCA Asian Pacific American Advocates National Center in Washington, DC. Um, with us today, we have our wonderful panelists um, and my good friend, First off, we have uh, Gazella Perez Kusakawa, the associate director, um, assistant director, sorry, of the Anti-Racial Profiling Project at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, also in Washington, DC. And my other good friend and colleague, Kendall Kosai, the director of policy at the Anti-Defamation League, the Western Division, uh, based in Washington State in Seattle, right, Kendall? Awesome. Um, before we get started into our conversation, though, uh, if you're not aware, last night uh, there was a report that broke news uh, early early this morning or late last night um, up in Dallas, Texas, that there was an open fire at a Korean hair salon. So at Hair World Salon, um, there was a suspect who is still on the run right now uh, who opened fire into the salon and injured three Korean women. Uh, right now, there aren't much, there's not much detail on the situation, but we do just want to hold a moment of silence uh, for these women um, and for the community. Thank you. Um, sending really warm thoughts to the Dallas community and, and our, our folks out there. But for folks in the chat who are here with us today, thank you for joining us. If you want to share in the chat where you're tuning in from, uh, we'd love to get to know you a bit more. And I think, you know, the, the incident in Dallas and of course the incidents over the past two years have brought us to this conversation today. Bellevue, college invited OCA to do a panel with them on API issues, racial profiling, anti-Asian hate incidences. And I definitely want, didn't want to do this talk alone. We have to bring in and think about 
all the collaboration and solidarity it's taken within the API community and also outside of our own community with the other um, you know, cross-cultural and cross-racial communities in order to tackle racial profiling and anti-Asian hate. So that's why, um, you know, thankfully my friends Kendall and Gazelle have agreed to join me to talk to you all today. Um, but first I know we're, we're mainly addressing the students at Bellevue College, but we're glad to have members of the public here. So um, in, you know, in terms of, you know, a this APA Heritage Month, we talk a lot about API representation. And honestly, for me, representation in the public service field and nonprofit sector was, did not exist where I was from. And I'm from, you know, the suburbs of Houston, Texas. I didn't know that, you know, you could, I could, I could make a living and, and pursue a career doing the work I do now at OCA or, um, the work that you all do. So um, starting off, Gisela, uh, can you just talk about your journey to um, advancing justice AAJC and, and what you do now there? Thank you so much, too. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a public interest attorney here at Asian Americans Advancing Justice AAJC. Um, I think how I got into this work, um, my background really played a huge role. I immigrated to the United States from Tondo, Manila in the Philippines. Um, it was really the part of the city that locals were scared to go to. Um, there was a lot of poverty and crime. I lived in one house uh, with multiple families that I was related to. We'd have our shower outside. Um, life was very unpredictable. Um, you know, you could try to go to the hospital, you could be rejected. It wasn't uncommon to have family members pass away just because we didn't have enough finances for medicine. And so I was always very cognizant that my move to the United States really changed the trajectory of my life. Um, and with that came an understanding of um, what can I do to give back to my community, um, to help family, friends, and other immigrants navigate what is a really difficult immigration system and how can we make sure that there's more compassion in that place? Um, oftentimes we don't have um, you know, compassionate people within the legal system. Um, and so that really um, you know, made me want to go to law school. It took me a while to get there. I, I taught children first and then um, I worked at a nonprofit, but eventually I decided um, as challenging as law school is, and as much as I heard there are a lot of mean people in the legal profession, I decided to take the plunge um, and I haven't regretted it. Um, I think it was when I was a law student and I was able to represent my first asylum seeker and win a grant of asylum for a mother and daughter that I realized that this is the right path for myself, that there is a place for um, compassion and kindness within our legal system. And in fact, it's what we really need. Um, so after I graduated, I became a uh, Napaba Law Foundation Community Law Fellow at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AJC. Um, and I, I sort of just made my way up as a staff attorney and then as an assistant director. And I, I worked with two and others in coalition um, to really uh, advance the anti-racial profiling space. Um, so we can combat this and, and really have a long-term um, strategic plan for our, our community. And certainly we've seen some wins along the way and we'll discuss the end of the China initiative, um, but there's still miles and miles to go. Um, so I know I'm in a very fortunate um, position right now and I hope many of you all consider um, entering the public interest space um, in any capacity. Thank you, Gazella. Um... Yeah, I, I think that's really funny because um, Kendall, your your partner is also a lawyer, um, but that's not what you pursued. Can you tell us what, what you pursued and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, so my name is Kendall Kosai. Um, I am Director of Policy for the ADL Western Division. Um, ADL is a century-old civil rights anti-hate organization dedicated to stopping the Jewish uh, defamation of the Jewish people and securing justice and fair treatment for all. Um, and so, you know, it, the, the organization has been, um, you know, very much involved in hate crimes work all across the country for, for decades. And so for, for me, you know, um, I'm a fourth generation Japanese American, born and raised here, right here in the uh, greater Puget Sound area. Um, and, I, and, you know, I went to school at UW and 
Um, but, you know, I've always had a family history of being rooted here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and part of our history is um, the Japanese American incarceration during World War II and how uh, my, gran my grandparents and my great grandparents were incarcerated uh, for four years, um, both in uh, Minidoka, Idaho and Heart, Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Um, you know, where, where they spent four years of their lives um, and, and losing essentially their civil liberties uh, during wartime. Uh, and, and we know how, um, you know, hate has ma manifested during that time and how they were treated and how they're not only when they're treated before they went off to incarceration, but also afterwards. And so, you know, my, my life's work and my, my work in, in um, you know, the, the anti-hate work space has been informed by those experiences and, um, you know, some of the things that has happened to them. And um, I, I've really taken a liking to it. So formerly uh, OCA um, staff member and, um, you know, worked in many of those spaces, current, current OCA national board member, OCA career sale board member. And I'm also a commissioner for the Washington State Commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs. Thanks, Kendall. And um, actually, a happy Teacher Appreciation Week to all the educators and former educators out there. So um, really grateful for your work. Um, so, you know, we continue to see like a rise in anti-Asian hate, even after, you know, the DOJ and the, the President Biden had issued memorandums um, at the beginning of last year. We just I, I, and, and, you know, we've discussed this before, but it's a combination of just like media m picking it up more. Um, these hate crimes have always been around, but the the rise in like visibility and um, coverage and also people, more people being aware about anti-Asian hate. Um, How has that impacted your work, Gazelle, as um, a, a staff attorney at a nonprofit and then Kendall, um, you know, you work for a Jewish American organization, um, your work there as like an Asian American being there. So I'll start with you, Gazella. Thank you. I think first and foremost, um, working in an Asian American civil rights organization, I think there's a dual component to the anti-Asian hate work. Um, one is that, you know, certainly we are all here as professionals um, working to advance and, and combat this hate and violence. But the second is also understanding the internal mental and emotional trauma um, that comes when you're also part of the impacted community. Um, and so it, it isn't, um, you know, it, it's always when certainly like news from yesterday when it came to Dallas, um, such a traumatizing experience for, for my colleagues as well as the, the broader Asian American community. And so it's so important for us to lift up visibility um, and also take care of ourselves as we go through this in a very um, you know, sympathetic, compassionate and gentle way. Um, but the reality is that you know, the violence against um, individuals because of personal characteristics has been a long serious problem in the United States. Um, certainly there was a surge in hate following the 2016 elections, not just against uh, people of Asian descent, but Muslims, um, Jews, immigrants, refugees, and people of color. And it became very clear to us that words matter. And so that this rise in anti-China rhetoric, this scapegoating of people of Asian descent for, for COVID and for economic insecurity um, has led to violence against Asian American communities. So part of the work we've done at Advancing Justice AJC, and as to mention, it's, it's a, a coalition of folks, um, but for, specifically for our organization, we've been working to raise awareness about the increasing racism and, and discrimination um, against Chinese Americans and against Asian Americans broadly. Um, part of that discrimination takes many forms, whether it's hostility and suspicion that Asian Americans are carriers of coronavirus um, or verbal abuse or even physical um, violence. And you know, as a civil rights organization, there's also the legal component that we touch. And oftentimes these things are very difficult to prove. Um, so first, just to explain the difference between what's a hate crime and a hate incident, a hate crime is considered a traditional offense. So it's similar to assault, but there's this added element of bias. Um, so that means there's, it's motivated by something like prejudice or pre um, a personal hatred. 
towards some sort of perceived characteristics, right? Because that's important because oftentimes Asians are seen as a monolith. Um, so it could include your race, it could include your color, your national origin, um, your religion or, or gender identity or sexual orientation. And in many cases, anti-Chinese sentiment has led to a broader anti-Asian sentiment within our community because there is such little differentiation and certainly um, we see this as a constant thing throughout our history. On the other hand, a hate incident is one that's perceived by the victim or any other person as being motivated by prejudice or hate. Um, so a common example of this would be verbal abuse, right? So in the form of people uh, blaming folks uh, for coronavirus, telling them to go back to China or take their virus back with them. Um, what's really important um, when it comes to handling all of these different attacks in our community is making sure that we report it appropriately. Um, that allows us to have visibility. It allows us to have a voice. So Asian Americans Advancing Justice uh, stood up our Stand Against Hatred website in January 2017, and I'm happy to, to plug that in later on in the chat. Um, and essentially that will allow you to report and allows us as a community to monitor hate across the country. Uh, we have it in multiple languages that include Chinese, Korean, and Vietnamese. Um, in addition, uh, we're also in communications with organizations who are also documenting uh, COVID-19 discrimination that includes OCA um, and two California organizations um, behind the website Stop AAPI Hate. Um, the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council and Chinese for Affirmative Action. Um, some of the stories that we've heard include um, students like yourselves um, who are being badgered or harassed, um, whether it's by their fellow classmates, um, whether it's strangers on uh, out in the street. And many times it, it this also escalates into violence. Um, we see this particularly for the elderly. And so it's really important that we report these crimes, but also that we have appropriate training. So AJC also works in collaboration with Hollaback, and this ensures that you have a better understanding of what can you do if you're a bystander and there is someone who's experiencing um, a hate crime or hate incident um, and what you can do. It, oftentimes allies are absolutely crucial in deterring violence against our communities. And so this is something that we think is a, a whole of um, American approach in how we can address this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Gazelle. And um, that's a great transition in just the way we've organized as a coalition to not only collect um, hate incidents reports, um, and, but also do that education, that bystander intervention training, um, and, and also work with allies. Because I think when, uh, for example, the Atlanta tragedy that happened last March um, of the shooting uh, of, um, among, among others, Asian American women in, in spas in Atlanta, Georgia, um, ADL among other community partners were the, the first to reach out to myself at OCA and our API partners, you know, just, you know, hey, what can we do? How can we be there? Um, so yeah, Kendall, in, you know, your work at ADL, how have you seen the past two years kind of impact your work? Has it made ADL like change course or just um, grow any programs that you're doing? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question. I think um, I, I always somewhat jokingly say that there's a lot of job security at ADL because hate is everlasting and always on the rise. And, um, you know, when we think about how the rise, if the, what it feels like a rise in anti-AAPI hate all across the country, um, you know, we, we often think about um, how it affects community, but not only just the AAPI community, but also all communities, all marginalized communities that are targeted for identity-based harassment. Um, and, and, you know, I think um, we often say here at ADL that an attack on one community is an attack on all because hate crimes in particular, they're message crimes, right? They're meant to instill fear in the community. They're meant to send a message to people that you're not welcome here a lot of times and um, that you're, you know, to remind you that you're different. 
um, and, and that, you know, there, there's a lot of hostility toward you. And so for, for, for me, um, you know, as a non-Jewish uh, ADL employee, it's about allyship. It's about how do we stand up together in across communities to ensure that we're, we're speaking out when things occur, right? To, to allow things not to be normalized. And when we talk about even the Jewish American experience to the AAPI experience, community experience, we often see a lot of parallels, right? So when we think about how, um, you know, Gazella just mentioned how, um, uh, you know, Asian Americans are being blamed for the coronavirus. You know, centuries ago, ago, Jews in particular were blamed for disease and different types of um, ills of society um, and were scapegoated in so many different kinds of ways. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that she'll talk about it later, but, you know, in terms of like this notion of dual loyalty, not, only, not to the United States, right, that we're perpetual foreigners, that, that Asian Americans don't, don't have loyalty to the U.S., but rather they, they have loyalty to their, you know, home country. Jews have experienced the same thing, even now, even today, where they're accused of dual loyalty to, um, you know, Israel rather than the United States. And so we, we see a lot of parallels in our communities, and that's just the Jewish community in particular. There are other communities that, that feel a certain way. And so our work at the ADL has shifted um, in the last several years to, to do a couple of things, right? So number one, to um, help provide um, guidance and resources and um, you know, just steering in a lot of different ways to the API community. Um, for example, the ADL was actually part of the founding of the Asian American Foundation, which was uh, formed just last year. Um, we actually, uh, our CEO actually holds a board of director seat on that organization as well. And, you know, um, you know, in addition to that, how do we collaborate more closely? And so here in the Pacific Northwest, here in Seattle, we're actually holding a special event next week. Uh, at the Wing Luke Museum. Um, that's the Asian American Jewish Initiative uh, to bring together folks from the Jewish community, from the AAPI community together to have to talk and have these conversations about how can we support each other. Um, and then you'll, the lastly, you'll see around just advocacy, at least here in Washington State, we've seen a broad coalition of organizations come together um, to in 2019 to revise our hate crimes laws, you know, um, to, to do a working group with the attorney general's office in 2020. And then subsequently next year, we'll have a bill package moving forward, most likely uh, around, um, you know, helping uh, our strengthen our hate crimes laws. So, you know, there's a lot of things that have happened in the last couple of years. And I think there's been a real sense of need for allyship and um, support for each other because there are so many commonalities in terms of our histories and the things that have happened to us historically, as well as today. So I, I think that that's why ADL has, um, you know, stepped into this space a, a little bit as well. Thank you for sharing, Kendall. And um, I think it's ADL has been a really great ally in that because, you know, the ADL has been around for so long, we've the AAPI community has also leaned on the organizations that have come before us, NAACP, um, represent, you know, from the Black community uh, and ADL, just providing us resources on, yeah, how do you come together um, and, and begin to, to fight? Um, I'm going to drop like everybody's, oh shoot, all of the links are blending together, but all of the links that everyone has mentioned, I'm just going to drop in the chat right there for you, including ADL's uh, initiative on um, uh, no hatred. But to, something that both of you have mentioned is um, rhetoric, messaging, and, um, you know, taking the taking our narrative, in, including just like how are hate crimes like covered in the media, and um, taking control over our narrative, something that we often talk about, you know, within our organizing space. Um, with all the coverage that's going on and all the like social media buzz, do you think right now the public is educated enough on anti-hate or anti-racial profiling? Like, um, I feel like, you know, Gazella, perhaps you can go a little bit more on the China initiative and the racial profiling that the government is, is doing to our communities is not talked about enough. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, I think in many ways, um, you know, when we look at anti-Asian hate and anti-racial profiling, um, they are two sides of the same coin. I say this because anti-Asian hate in many ways has more visibility because this is something where you're seeing oftentimes individual attacks, right? These are 
regular people out on the street and they're committing real horrible crimes. On the other hand, there is anti-racial profiling, which is focused much more on how the federal government is treating the Asian American and Asian immigrant community. And there, there isn't as much education. Um, certainly for both of them, we need mass education across the country. We need a look into Asian American history to address all of the bias and stigmas. But for anti-racial profiling um, specifically, Considering how often Asian Americans are scapegoated as national security threats, there doesn't seem to be this continuous education for the public. Um, what recently, um, as to mention, the Department of Justice announced the end of the China Initiative. Um, basically, the China Initiative was a Department of Justice program that was meant to, or allegedly meant to, uh, combat economic espionage. But instead, what we found was there was this disproportionate impact on people of Asian descent, particularly Chinese scientists and researchers, and a heightened focus um, on academics who were particularly vulnerable uh, because of all of these discrepancies and holes in what were um, ambiguous disclosure requirements. And so it was a situation that was very disheartening. It resulted in a chilling effect for professors and students across the country. We have a legal referral service here at Advancing Justice AJC. So we would hear accounts uh, where people are not able to return to their studies. We would hear of stories where people are scared to apply for a federal grant application, and they would prefer that their white professor counterpart were applying for these instead, despite them being the ones doing the actual work. Um, there'd be folks who are scared to naturalize and fill out their information. So there was this constant fear and, and distrust that somehow they would be targeted based on their ethnicity and background. And one of the things that folks uh, fail to realize when we think about th this type of pattern is that this is something that has been ongoing for a long time. Uh, Kendall shared the experience that his family had with Japanese incarceration. And we think of that time as simply wartime hysteria. But during the incarceration of Japanese Americans, the federal government genuinely and strategically thought that they were doing something to prevent espionage on US lands. They thought that people of Japanese descent were more prone to acts of sabotage or espionage than other people based on simply their national origin. And so there continues to be this misperception, this heightened scrutiny that we pe people of Asian descent are somehow less loyal or disloyal to the United States, that we are perpetual foreigners that can't be trusted. And this has long-term ramifications for us. So it's very important that we remember that history to understand why does it continue to repeat itself post 9-11 when it comes to Arab, Muslim, um, South Asian, communities and why does it continue to happen today with the China initiative that we're working to to really dismantle in all forms. Yeah, absolutely. And even now, as you know, the China initiative has supposedly ended, we're still hearing stories from um, academics and scholars across the country. Uh, you know, I'm from Texas and I had a friend reach out to me that, you know, a friend of a friend, uh, you know, in West Texas, was is being investigated and it was it was quite sudden and um, they had no one to turn to and so um, I think this is definitely something that is an ongoing issue that's not going away anytime soon and um, you know panels like this is why we're trying to bring a piece of that public education um, to to folks for awareness so um, Kendall in terms of like social media messaging rhetoric that's kind of where the hate is nowadays online um, how have you seen our communities like unite over that? What is kind of the work, some of the work you're doing um, around just trying to like take control of the narrative? Absolutely. And, you know, it, it doesn't take folks uh, much time to see anti AEPA uh, rhetoric um, when they're online. Um, you know, these, these social media companies have done a, a less than um, great job of kind of controlling that narrative, controlling the misinformation, controlling that disinformation around 
um, you know, scapegoating APIs for the, the coronavirus, right? Um, they've done a horrible job of allow, they continue to allow um, the kind of hate speech that has disaspirate impacts on our communities to, you know, and making us feel unwelcome and unsafe in a lot of different spaces. Um, you know, the algorithms, algorithms that they feed people, you know, white nationalist, neo-Nazi content um, that they amplify to, to individual, you know, young impressionable individuals, um, you know, has real impact, right? And so when we talk, you know, oftentimes ADL sees the online space, the, on, the, the, the rise of online hate as the next frontier of how hate perpetuates itself in our societies, right? Because we often say that um, hate in online spaces have consequences in offline physical spaces. And so when we're often, you know, the, this rhetoric that's, that's, you know, ratcheting up online, that, that's creating this, this sentiment, um, does eventually lead to, potentially leads to violence in a lot of different cases. We've seen how, um, you know, a lot of these folks who are involved in shootings, um, you know, white supremacist shootings at synagogues and at different things, you know, they, they espouse anti-Semitism, racism, anti-immigrant feelings. Um, and so, you know, and these things before were not as accessible, right? You'd have to go to like, uh, physically go to a meeting to, to access these spaces, but these online social media and, and content providers are allowing folks to like live in these spaces um, that allows them to be radicalized um, and, and in turn cre creates a massive, ma massive security um, safety issue for, for all a lot of different and all communities really. And so, um, you know, our work is around how do we hold those social media as accountable? How do we take a peek under the hood about what their hate content policies are? What are they doing around stopping the, the amplification of some of these, um, you know, radicalization and, and um, you know, white supremacist content to, that they're feeding people? And so our, our work at the ADL is really around finding solutions to, number one, examine the problem, right? And really understand how pervasive it is. Um, you know, we know from the Francis Haugen uh, leaks recently that, um, you know, 90, only 5% of uh, hate, hate content is caught and only 1% of that is actioned. And so that leaves 95% that continues to live on their platforms. And so how are we really addressing these issues um, through transparency, through better regulation, um, through, through fighting, you know, making sure that folks have um, better digital literacy uh, in navigating these spaces. And how are we off-ramping people from being radicalized in these spaces as well um, is, a, is a really big issue uh, on how to fight back against hate. And so our, our work really on, on uh, we have what's called the Center on Technology and Society, really looks at and is a data is a data driven approach and victim centered approach to ensuring that folks um, feel safe in online spaces as well as physical spaces offline. Thank you, Kendall. And um, I just want to tell our audience that we will have time for Q&A actually with our guests. So if you want to drop any questions in the Q&A box or the chat, we'll be happy to answer them. But um, bringing it back to like coalition and the importance of having partners and allies, um, how, yeah, how have you utilized like your community? Uh, if you, uh, for, for those who are like new to um, coalition building and community organizing, like what are some of the ways that you have utilized like relationships, partnerships, um, and, and cross-cultural um, bonds uh, in, in your work. Um, I'll throw it over to Gisela first. Thank you. I think especially when it came to anti-racial profiling, coalition work was so important. Um, one, this is an area where there's so much intersection of expertise. There's a national security component, there's an immigration component, and there's a technology component. So in many ways, we needed experts from very different um, backgrounds. And the other part is that fundamentally, every single um, you know, work that we do starts with those who are impacted. And so it was crucial to work with groups like OCA, UCA, and those who really had those connections on the ground with Asian Americans across the country um, to be able to have a real movement um, that could enact change. And I think what was tremendous is that, you know, Advancing Justice AJC spearheaded the coalition um, that included OCA, ACLU, Brennan Center, and, and many of our colleagues in this space 
to speak with the White House, to speak with different federal agencies, because racial profiling is something that is an interagency problem. Um, it is something that we had to stop and, and really provide a framework for in the future. And so it isn't possible without coalition work. Uh, we don't have enough resources to get many of these changes without working um, together. And I think it's very important, especially when you're looking at um, Asian American civil rights issues, there's so many communities involved. Um, and even as we end the China initiative, we want to broaden this coalition for other communities of color, because any anti-racial profiling work we do is gonna have tremendous impacts even outside the Chinese American community and outside the Asian American community. It's gonna set precedent for many other communities of color in the future. And so coalition work makes sure that we are inclusive and that this is actual change that works for everyone long-term. Thank you, Gazelle. Um, yeah, I think I brought this panel together because everything that Kendall and Gazella talks about is essentially like a little bit of what OCA does in terms of just mobilizing you all in the audience to to participate in the advocacy work, right? Um, Kendall, how about you? Yeah, I mean, for 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 me, um, building coalitions and and building partnerships is all about showing up for each other, right? Physically, um, you know, emotionally if showing up for each other is so important. And so I oftentimes think about when the Tree of Life shooting happened in Pittsburgh, right? Um, and ha while it was in Pittsburgh and it was primarily affecting the Jewish community, um, you know, folks from the Muslim community, folks from the API community, folks from the Latino community, folks from, you know, the African-American community, they came together at a local synagogue, uh, Temple de Sinai here in Seattle, um, and, and they stood together in solidarity. They held signs that say, you know, I support, you know, the Jewish community, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about you. I, I'm, I'm, but I think, you know, equally important when we talk about time, you know, showing up in times of crisis, times of tragedy, uh, we also have to think about showing up in good times as well, right? To celebrate with each other, to think about like the, the good things that unite our communities and the things that, you know, we, we share in our humanity, really. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, for, for the API community, a lot of times that's food, right? And, and, showing, and you know, just really having a dinner. Um, you know, in, in the Jewish community, we oftentimes think about, um, you know, Shabbat, which is typically held on Fridays. And folks um, are invited from all communities to, to the dinner table. Right to to have conversation, to break bread, to to think about um, you know what to reflect upon the week and the things that we're grateful for. So I mean, you know, I, I think it is it is about showing up um, physically and emotionally in good time in bad times as well as good times. And so um, for for me, I think that's been a, a real big winning formula and, and showing the 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 goodwill with each other. Right that that. Um, we have more in common than we do, um, you know, differences. And so uh, I, I really appreciate how much the um, you know, community here in Seattle, at the very least, right? We, we try our best to work together and we can do more. We can definitely do more. Um, but it, it's really important to continue to show each other that, that um, we stand with each other uh, during good and bad times. Thanks, Kendall. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of uh, at the crux of, you know, what OCA tries to do with our partners at Advancing Justice AJC and folks like ADL is um, in all of this big work, like it sounds really big, right, tackling you know, racial profiling, tackling um, anti-Asian hate and such. But at the end of the day, when you put together, you know, all of our organizations and all the different components, right, bringing narratives from the communities, from the grassroots communities to, you know, the issue area expertise that folks like Gazella provides. Um, and then, you know, Kendall just being that um, oftentimes like convener, just convening folks and making the connections um, is how how we tackle like such big issues, right? And, and so I don't want to intimidate you know, our um, college audience or, or for folks who are, are new to, you know, advocacy and stuff, um, because you, you don't have to be a lawyer to do this work and you don't have to have had many years or be at a national organization like the ADL or OCA to do that work. So um, what would you say are some ways that students or individuals, you know, just now learning about China Initiative or Anti-Asian Hate, um, how can they like get get involved and support our community, um, Gisela. 
So actually, students are the future of anti-racial profiling work. Um, in many ways, you all are could have so much more significant impact than some of our organizations at this point. Um, because what we're seeing is that racial profiling is being an issue across academic institutions in the country. Um, students and professors are impacted, but in many ways as students, you have the flexibility to really be vocal and outspoken and to really educate the, the older and generation about Asian American history, about these patterns of profiling that are based on this pretext of national security issues because we're seen as perpetual foreigners. A lot of times education comes from young people and a lot of the changes in movement we are able to achieve come from young people. And so you being able to mobilize in your own universities, um, making sure that you're standing up for your rights and the rights of professors who are impacted, that has a tremendous change. So a good example is um, recently Yale students had um, organized to, to be more outspoken against anti-racial profiling issues. Uh, we actually have one intern um, from there who had uh, led a lot of that work at Advancing Justice AJC. And so that does have such a strong impact. And I know from professors that I've spoken to that advocacy from students is really something that is, is very moving for them. Um, so your voice actually is, is perhaps what we need the most right now. I'm going to give a plug. I, I definitely agree. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to give a plug uh, or several plugs, I guess, at this point. Um, for So the first thing that students can do, um, they can help join OCA Greater Seattle chapter uh, right here in the Puget Sound region. So our website is OCA Greater, ocaseattle.org. Sign up, become a member, get involved in many of the different events that we have going during the month of May or throughout the rest of the year. Um, you know, we're oftentimes looking for interns as well. So if you, you know, as a student, you know, if you want to get involved and really learn to be in, in this space, it would be, it's really great. Um, the other thing that I'll plug is the OCA internship program too. I don't know if you're going to do that, but I'll do it anyways. Um, as a former intern, OCA uh, national intern myself in 2011, who is also an OCA intern as well, um, at, you know, several years ago, it was, it's a great opportunity to learn, to, to grow, to come into your identity uh, and um, at the same time, get some working experience and get a, you know, it's one of the few um, API organizations that actually pays a stipend for, for the summer as well. Um, so we're, we're really proud to, you know, OCA is really proud to put that program on for the last 30 years. Um, and then, you know, two other organizations I'll just plug real quick is um, that I'm at least part of is the Commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs. Um, I think I see Toshiko Hasegawa and Executive Director Hasegawa in the, the attendees list here. Um, but just a quick shout out to them for all the work that they do with community and in community. Um, and so check their website out at kappa.wa.gov. Hey, Toshiko. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I would always say the, to, to check out the um, you know, plethora of API organizations that are here in the Puget Sound region, right? There, there are social service organizations, there's immigration related, uh, you know, organizations, there's health related organizations, there's, you know, cultural based organizations. Find your niche, find, find, find where you kind of find your interests are in and um, take it as an opportunity uh, to get involved in the community because I think, um, you know, for, for me, it starts at education, it starts at cross community collaboration, it starts at building these relationships with our community within and with and outside of our communities as well. So those are my plugs, I guess, at the current moment. Thanks, Kendall. Yeah, and I, I also know um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AJC, uh, the DC affiliation and also affiliates across the country also host interns, fellowships, um, youth leadership summits um, and conferences. I mean, one of the best things I think about being in college at the time, and I didn't realize it until I started working in this like advocacy space is like your network from college becomes um, a source of power and community to you when you're doing this work. Um, I also wanted to plug ECOS in, uh, which is local to Washington, but for those of you who are interested in environmental conservation and environmental justice, um, you know, I think civil rights encompasses a lot of different things, um, including, you know, women's health rights, um, environmental justice. Oh yes, and Kapal, the other DC internship program. Lots of opportunities to get involved out there, but 
um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the easiest way is to volunteer, but then also um, open, open yourself up to, you know, personal and professional and community development through kind of our internship programs, whether you're like pre-med, pre-law, pre-business or whatnot. I think doing an internship with a nonprofit um, civil rights org is, is really um, helpful. Um, yeah, I wanna, t- I know we're talking and plugging a lot of resources, but I wanna turn it over to Sunny. Do we have any questions that come in? I don't know. I missed anything in the chat. Um, Sunny, are you there? Yep, I'm here and there doesn't seem to be any questions. You guys were very thorough, you're very clear and you give us hope for students and faculty and staff on what we can do because we are, as you say, we are the future and we do have the potential to change for the better for the new generation and to help the older generation as well. Awesome, thank you, Sunny. Yeah, well, I was just wanna thank my friends, Giselle and Kendall, thanks for being on with me this hour. Um, thank you, Sunny and Leslie and Pavi, the team at Bellevue College for having us. Um, check out Bellevue Colleges. Uh, if you want to talk about your other APEM events and also check out all the links below. I'm sure they'll send it out to you all. Yes. So in the spirit of API Month, we are promoting events to help our API community and to help our community since in the time of our quarantine and isolation and remote learning, we may not be as strong as we were before, but when you build these communities through events, through organizations, you see that, um, as all of our panelists say, that colleges are one of the few times that you are given a plethora of resources and opportunities, and you need, it's a great opportunity to meet the people that can truly help you, or you can build up to help each other. So I will just put my plug in. And I'm always available as well. My email is in the website. So I'm always happy to help anyone who needs me. One last thank awesome. you. Thank you to all of you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you, everybody. Have a good you. rest of your afternoon. Bye.